So, we are back for the second talk. I'm uh, really pleased to introduce uh, Peter Bilak. Peter was born in uh, Czechoslovakia and he lives in the Netherlands. He works uh, in the field of uh, editorial design, typographic, and type design. He teach at the Type and Media Postgraduate co course at the Royal Academy of Art in The Hague. Start type in uh, 1999, dot 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 in 2000, Indian Time Foundry in uh, 2009, Work That Work magazine in 2012, and Fonstone in 2015. Not bad. <laughs> Personally, I have to say I'm really pleased to introduce Peter because in 1997, as a graphic de designer, fond of type design and uh, letter design, I bought a book called Transparency. In, uh, very rare. Yeah, very rare. Very rare. There is uh, 800 copies, and I have the number 43. <laughs> so for me, tonight, it's a talk of Peter, but it's also a book signature for me. So. Welcome to you, Peter, and uh, let's have a good talk. Bonsoir. Good evening. I'm really, I'm really happy to be here. It's not very often that I'm in Paris and speaking about work, uh, so really, I'm very proud to, to be here. And I'll, I can do it in English, too, which is exceptional. Uh, I was trying to find a way how to approach what I'm going to talk about um, so it makes sense because there are different activities. Um, I've been, I just spent the last couple of weeks working on a dance project, but it gets really messy about you know, linking all these projects together. And then I decided that I'll make the link with time. It's been over 20 years since I lived in Paris, uh, as you mentioned. I studied at the Atelier National de Création Typographique before it was Recherche Typographique. And, uh, uh, and I loved returning ever since. So I'll be talking about time and all the projects which are related to it. Um. Okay, I'll use something else. No? No. So, okay. This is my studio um, in The Hague where I, where I work. The poster which you see there on the wall with an arrow, the arrow which leads to an arrow, uh, is this. It's a, it's a poster that I made some time ago. I made it about 10 years, well, I made it uh, in 2000 when we just switched to 21st century. And it's a calendar of 21st century. And I expect that somewhere there, uh, there'll be my end of my life, uh, along with other ends and beginnings. Uh, and every day I come to studio, I cross a line of another day. And it makes me mi nicely kind of aware of time passing by. Uh, so it includes all the dates that you that you imagine. It's a very simple thing. It's a huge uh, poster, but uh, you know I think it puts kind of this perspective on what we're doing. That uh, what that we're here for a certain period of time, but we're leaving something behind which may may, may stay longer. Um, from the projects, which are time related, um, I'll show something from this. this. So this is works at work, and uh, some of the things we've shown was uh, was also dealing with time. I don't know if you know this, this is a, a music instrument. This is an organ uh, in a German church uh, which plays the probably the slowest concert ever produced, which is designed to last 639 years. And every couple of years they change the tone. And you see these bags with sand, they controlling this organ and the sounds being changed. It's the John Cage's as slow as you can uh, uh, piece performed to last six centuries. Quite incredible if you think that uh, we'll only experience a very small portion of this concert, but someone else will you know, perceive another part, and we have to ta make sure that uh, other people will continue doing it. I really have this interest in long duration. Uh, another thing which we, m we discussed in Works at Work was this oldest company in the world. And the oldest company in the world is a construction company. It's a building company. It's a family-run company which exists for 1,400 years old. 
86 generations of, you know, of family, uh, building temples in Japan. And uh, these temples, like this one, they've seen everything. You know, like, uh, when this was built, nothing around was, was there. It's a company and temples which are older than most countries, older than some religions and, uh, and many parts of the world. And I find it incredible that how you design for such a long duration. Um, and it's, it's quite something because, uh, so this, this temple is from fourth century AD. And if you think of uh, building for such a long duration, closer, if you're building for such a long duration, you would imagine that you would choose the, long, the longest lasting material. Uh, but in fact, this is built from wood, uh, which is a not very long lasting material. Um, but the, the long lasting approach is built in the maintenance of it, not in the material. So uh, uh, every 100 years, every piece of wood is being replaced by another piece of wood. So it's regenerating itself. It's kind of organism, it's like skin, which re regenerates. So the, the, the architecture regenerates itself. Uh, so it's not you know, physical properties, but it's something else. It's a maintenance, it's an approach which is built to last. Okay, I'll go back and I'll spe be speaking mainly about type design. And this was my very first text typeface I produced uh, here in Paris uh, in 94 um, and was published in 97. So these are the typefaces I designed and published so far. Uh, they, they are larger. Uh, it's every couple of years, you know, there's some gaps between them. And um, they sorted alphabetically, but they also designed in alphabetically, alphabetical order. What is interesting, I find now when I was looking at this, that this is basically also a list of bestsellers. So it's basically the older, the better it sells. It, it shows you that typefaces tend to last a very long time and they continue being relevant for a long time. And usually the newcomers, they need to establish themselves before they become relevant. Um, you know, the advantage of you know, our Type Foundry Tipotech does not work with distributors. And advantage is of course that I see exactly you know, the tendencies of sales. And we see that uh, it takes on average, our, our phones take about four to five years before they established and start you know, reach their peak which is something curious, you know, okay, so we design something which takes long time to design. For example, I don't know, uh, well, any of these projects would take years uh, to produce. And then it takes another couple of years before, you know, it may hit a certain kind of target and possibly, you know, people can recognize it, start using it. So it's how do you design for such thing? How do you design for the future when you don't know what the future will bring? We have no idea, we know it's very hard to plan ahead for so long, yet we confronted with this question about again and again about making your work relevant, and I'll get to a more extreme example of this about designing, uh, de making design for the future. Um, this I just finished this book. It's not important. Uh, it's not a great book, but it's I read it out of interest. I, I'm showing it because I took this picture yesterday when I was preparing for this uh, for this lecture, because it is a book about future. It is about Elon Musk, who is kind of this visionary uh, ent entrepreneur, and uh, the book discusses, you know, life on Mars and you know, like uh, how the world will change and what actions we need to take. What I found astonishing is, like, while discussing this, it's using a 16th-century typeface, and it makes you also wonder, like, how relevant things can be. You know, so while talking about futurism, it's, it's using you know the most established things because. This work is built, it was made to last. Um, I'll come back to this. Uh, okay, I'll talk a bit about uh, our fonts. Uh, Greta was a newspaper typeface, and you know, it was, it's the quickest typeface I produced. It's not the, you know, I made fun things, uh, you know, a lot of fun projects, which took a long time, but this was a newspaper typeface, which seems to come one of the most serious typefaces you can produce. But it was probably the long, uh, the fastest made typeface I, I made. I remember clearly uh, being asked. It, it started as a co custom corporate typeface for a newspaper, and I've been asked to. Uh, I believe in the middle of October, I received a phone call from newspaper, which was being redesigned, asking me if I wanted to do it, and I said yes, of course I want to do it, uh, except I'm just going on holidays, and we we planned a trip to Tibet for five weeks, and the project had to be ready by first of January. So I was called in October, 
the de de deadline was in 1st of January and I was leaving for five weeks. Uh, but still it seemed like, a, well, yeah, we, ca we can do it. Uh, it was made quickly because I believe that you know, if you have a very cl precise brief, and the brief was basically a visual one, uh, it's a newspaper uh, published in eight and a half points. You know, you have know ex exactly the language, you know exactly how many words have fit there. You can test it and you can work towards a certain target very, very quickly. The reason why most of typefaces take so slow is because you don't know how it's going to be used. You don't know the language, you don't know the size, you don't know the medium, you don't know well anything about how it's going to be used. If all these questions are removed, working towards shapes is very quick. So this was uh, Greta text, uh, and uh, at the end it was published as a in our collection. It's not an exclusive typeface, and uh, when I was looking for a way to present it. I was looking for a real person called Greta to put a face to this typeface, and I couldn't find one. I was looking, f I was trying to find an adult, young adult called Greta, and I couldn't find. It seemed to be like a name for very old women. I only met like really, really, really old ladies. Uh, and then I found, um, I, I think I asked on Twitter, and I, one of the replies was from Jürgen Siebert, who is the uh, owner of Font Shop, who said like his daughter is called Greta. So this is uh, little Greta Siebert. Uh, Thank you, Jürgen, for allowing me to use your daughter. On, uh, uh, and from the beginning, it was clear that, you know, okay, you associate it with the face, but what is interesting is not the only the person, but the development of the person. So years later, Greta Sanz came out. Uh, it took about four years to do. So in four years, the little Greta became bigger Greta. So this is the same person uh, on the second catalog. Um, and uh, you just see you know, how time progresses. So let's talk about a little bit about type design too. <laughs> um, this morning, I, I had the pleasure to see students' works, and we kept talking about the same thing. How do you choose the right weight for something? How do you know when it's, you know, what is regular, what is bold? And you cannot know. You cannot know un until you create the extremes. And the, the what I believe and what, you know, what we do in The Hague is that, you know, you have to define parameters, extreme, ex extreme parameters of you know what is the lightest, what is the darkest, and your design happens in the middle. Uh, you know your design is encapsulation of all the possibilities, and uh, you need to do it at the same time, not to do it later. You know when the design is ready, so you're not designing just the light, but it, this is drawn at the same time because it's exploring. This design is about the, all these possibilities. It's not about one single shape, which I think is also exciting because it means that physical limitations in software, you know, where you work with a grid thousand by thousand pixels uh, uh, units are there. But if you remove them and you think that the design is about the relationship between shapes, I think it offers you a lot more possibilities. I think the first one who, who recognizes these possibilities is obviously Adrian Frutiger. Uh, and his universe, it's not it's you know it's strong not because of its shapes you know if you look at its shapes of universe it's using forms which have been there long before it's not unique because of this universe is unique because it explores the gaps between designs it categorizes it organizes and it designs the frequencies you know the the, the, the distances between different weights how heavy should be bold how much heavier should be another weight how much lighter should be something else and finding a very clever way to organize it. I think now we take this for granted, but before Frutiger, you know, both typefaces existed, but they were not clearly related to each other. You know, you had a bunch of very condensed, very light, very bold typefaces, but you know, you without a clear relationship of how, it, how they should be used. Uh, what the universe does, it makes this kind of, you know, quite easy to understand order uh, and relationship between weight and width and uh, and the cursives. So, uh, what we do and what we did, for example, with Greta is like designing design spaces, you know. And it starts with, you know, going how far you can go before it's too much, you know, exploring the the completely the most ridiculous weights, which are probably not very useful. You know, this is like the the most condensed, darkest weight which can be made, which is not very useful, but needs to be made there in order to recognize what is useful. Because if I only create uh, something useful here, I don't know if I can do something even more heavier 
which can be possibly used. Uh, and it going, going in all directions. Once space like this is designed, then it's chopped to the usable parts. So this would be kind of unused, but, and then something else would, would be used. Uh, but you need to do the full specter of possibilities to decide what you know, is and what is not useful. And then the trouble with systems like this is that it often invites you know, compromises. And to avoid compromises, you need to take exceptions. So at one point, you start seeing that uh, you know, some things just don't work. If you use circular dots and you go in to hairline, the circular dot will stop, stop working. That's very clear. So what are you going to do? You have to kind of come up with exceptions uh, to your system. So on one hand, the typeface is very systematic. On the other hand, you have to build in all the things which break the systems because it, becomes too I because it wouldn't work. So it's a system and an anti-system within it, within it. You know, at one point, shapes like this becomes too complex and has to be replaced with simplified shape. And there are plenty of exceptions to the system to make it, again, work. Uh, result would be this, which would be its 80 different styles and, uh, um, and come with uh, plenty of pictograms and uh, uh, yeah, quite, quite a few of them. Each of these pictograms comes with 10 different weights as well. And then uh, it comes with a lot of lang extended language support. Uh, and by now, Greta works in one, two, well, five different writing scripts. And all these different writing scripts come with the same number of styles, which is unprecedented. You know, I get to see that uh, it gives you plenty of possibilities for expression. I think we are particularly proud to, uh, I work with Christian Sarkis, a Lebanese designer uh, who worked at, who lives in the Netherlands, uh, who designed Greta Arabic. And I was very pleased to see how Greta can do, uh, you know, first kind of low uh, contrast model for Arabic, which is, you know, uh, in so many ways, which is fairly unusual, but also exploring different widths, which hasn't really been done in Arabic. You know, you don't really have models for, you know, uh, writing models for t t to explore this. So completely different solutions have to be used for, for many, many things. Um, and we're doing the same thing with, with Hebrew right now, which again, I think makes the whole system a lot more useful. You know, like a, having ability to set, you know, all these different writing scripts and for example, Arabic, Hebrew and Latin together or with Cyrillic is, uh, you know, fairly un unusual or unprecedented in so many different styles. This is not yet published. Uh, it will be probably next, published after September uh, when it's all finished. But it will be again come with as many ways as you expect. Um, it's the right place to talk about Milan Kundera because it's exactly the, the interpolation between you and me. It's a, you know, it's a, a writer born in Czechoslovakia who came to Paris. Um, you, pr you know him, I, I, do, I do think this is, is probably his best book, Immortality. Um, and uh, what I found really fascinating was an idea uh, which really captured my imagination and was the idea that you know, in order to retell a story, to tell a, tell a new story, you don't need to follow a linear historical line. Uh, most of typefaces or most of books or most of movies they find, you know, they identify a point in history and they, s they stick to it. They try to create historical costumes and historical setup and make them l behave in a historical way. In Immortality, uh, Kundera proposes something which he calls polyhistory, mixing different parts of history to his advantage. You know, he creates situations where a contemporary hero from 21st century can speak to Goethe you know, writer who's been long dead for some centuries. That situation opens new possibilities. You know, how can you, you know, you learn something else from a dialogue with a dead person than you learn from a living person. And that idea uh, allowed me to, to restructure a project which I worked, which I started working on in Paris. When I worked in Paris, I worked on this kind of layering typeface, but I didn't really know what to do with it until I kind of understood that, you know, I just lack in the structure. And the structure was um, clarified in this, you know, so it was this 21 different layers uh, which are informed by history of Roman capitals, uh, which have gone 
largely kind of unchanged for almost 2,000 years. And the changes were formal ones. Uh, you know, so it was uh, different types of series, different types of contrast, different types of uh, uh, modulation. And if you create this, something like this, it becomes kind of semi-educational tool. You can take, you know, basic skeleton, apply Bodoni-like uh, contrast, uh, the right types of series, and you get something baro fairly baroque. Or you can take, you know, the Renaissance uh, contrast and, you know, the kind of the Garamond-like series, and you end up with something like this. Uh, so you can recreate what has been there. But I think, again, more interesting is, instead of recreating what has existed, is to remix possibilities and create something which has not existed, uh, which is, for example, this. You know, you take the bitmap structure and you still put this uh, Bodoni series there and you end up with something which just could not be there. Uh, and <laughs> just by, <laughs> by playing along, you know, it's a bit like a musical approach to remixing music, you know, like that you can remix parts, but the system is designed that it, it accepts, you know, like that all, the, uh, all the layers are compatible so allow you this easy, easy layering. And to do this, you know, we would come up with uh, uh, this, this little thing, which I don't know if it's still online, uh, that allows uh, layering uh, with single entry, uh, text entry. And of course, you know, like a, I think critic would say like, well, this will give you plenty of really bad choices. And it's true, you know, like it can create monstrous possibilities, but there are some really exciting ones as well. You just have to find them. And there's so many of them that it is exciting to search for it. And I think the part of the fun in type design, oh, finally I'm speaking. <laughs> you haven't probably heard what I said so until now, right? Okay, okay. Shall I repeat everything? <laughs> now part of the fun of type design is that um, to anticipate what users will make. And uh, you know, the user is active part of type design because it completes the work of type designer. You know, when type designer produces a work and sends it out there, it's unfinished. It's you, people who use fonts, they finish the work by put, giving in context, by, you know, by making their choices. Um, so it's really exciting to see like, what people do with something like this, which gives you so many possibilities. And again, the advantage of publishing fonts directly is that, that we, we see exactly what people do with this. So uh, this is history. and. Um, History can look like anything, you know, it can look very historic, historical. This is an exhibition at Guggenheim Museum in New York, um, which, you know, it looks very classical and it's, it's great. Um, and this is again a French piece of work. Uh, this is uh, the best design books of France from a couple of years back, uh, designed by Studio Magnani Nicola. And it looks very avant-garde. You know, so the same typeface can look uh, very avant-garde or it can look very playful uh, or it can look, you know, like this. Um, I think it invi invites you to explore the possibilities without having very specific appearance. I think it includes the work of designer in the process a lot more. Since I'm talking about time, I'll briefly mention this. You probably know what I'm going to mention. For most of the time, people thought about how do you make expensive phones more available to, to people, and they thought about reducing price is the only way. Um, we decided that time was the solution, and time meaning to restrict how long you work with type affects the price. So if you want to use very expensive phone, instead of uh, paying the full price, and having it forever, how about if you pay only small small amount and use it for a short period of time? So this is basically the premise of FontStand, which is kind of a standalone program that where you can try any fonts for free, and then if you like it, you can you can rent it for one month because you rarely use something every day for the rest of your life, while you expect it to pay for it for you know for for this period. Uh, so it's you know with a few simple clicks you activate it, you have it, and uh, you will pay 10% of the price. So it's just making the connection between price and, and uh, time and money is are very closely related. But um, this is the main project I came to talk about, and uh, because I th I thought it's really the right place, you know, to speak about uh, Grand Paris, 
uh, project which is uh, you know being just in development and this location um, you probably heard about this you know just like everyone here because it concerns everyone who lives in the city um, and I'll just make a few notes you know what I'm going to show is very much work in progress you know and, uh, uh, and probably it will change many times still um, so you probably know that the Grand Paris was announced a few years back you know what is it three years back uh, announced as a you know this master plan for development of transportation uh, very ambitious plan that you know will build you know there's in different numbers I understand there's 80 stations I read somewhere 60 stations here's 72 stations not always clear um, so this is a reality a project which is going to take place uh, in next couple of decades and you probably heard also this that uh, Rudy Bor uh, Integral they won the pitch to realize this project and uh, it's a very complex project for which they do have expertise and they work with a team of architects uh, to to propose orientation system uh, next thing I heard was uh, that th that there's a new typeface to be made and uh, I, I receive a phone call from them about discussion about what this should be and it's a uh, it's an interesting proposition designing a typeface for something which doesn't exist and it will not exist for another t 20 years it's a typeface which will be used in 2035 uh, you know something that you know is not there and it, we don't know like uh, what technology we'll be using you know are we going to use LED screens are we going to use e-ink e papers or holograms you know how do we design something for the faraway future while while still want to make aim for freshness innovation and something very or cl and clarity um, I think usually it happens in science fiction movies or in books if you aim for the future you usually look in the past it's usually a safe way um, and looking in the past you see that uh, the metro has a rich history of typography you know uh, for the longest part the history of typography in the metro is uh, largely anonymous uh, we don't really know who designed these letters uh, we know the companies which built it will build them we know you know how long they've been there but we don't know about the lettering artist you know it's kind of ingenious uh, tile tile methods for placing them there we probably know that uh, they are almost hundred years old uh, and they are they're beautiful what is quite nice about it is that all these different layers of history uh, they coexist this this layer is this is a uh, adaptation of uh, Frutiger's universe uh, this is made in the 80s together with Hans-Jörg Hunziker and we of course know the beautiful example of Parisine which is specifically designed for Metro it was the one of the first ones you know if you look at the previous ones they are adaptations of existing typefaces this is adaptation of universe uh, this one is specially commissioned to perform as a you know signage typeface for the Metro and is doing the job really really well so you know you, you probably know that Jean-François Porchez designed it in the in the uh, mid 90s and it has been used ever since and it's performing really well and it unites the different parts of the metro and and buses and all you know transportation system the idea of uh, the Grand Paris project is not to replace them you know okay, these things stay in place uh, just as all the different layers they stay in place you know I think this has been very fortunate not to remove the old parts. I think it's really nice that you know you find these kind of archaeological layers like excavations of you know and it, it and it points to time and location what has been made that made there. Uh, and you see like uh, okay so this is the 1980s and this is the 90s and further 21st century. The new typeface um, I had a briefing it started uh, about two years ago. Um, and we spoke with Rudy and, uh, and the team about what we want to do and they didn't really know exactly what to do uh, you know they are quite ambitious you know they always want to do more than they asked uh, and I proposed you know like a saying like a it would be nice where the typeface encapsulates and expresses more than just pure information something which resonated quite well with uh, with Antigral uh, except it's not very easy so there was a naive idea uh, to try something like this you know like a, that you know, when you do basic uh, calligraphy, you know, you have a basic skeleton and then you apply certain contrast depending like how you hold the pen. That's, you know, how things are done. And that results in particular type of uh, shape. Uh, 
the idea was like, well, could you indicate directions with something like this, just by changing angle, that, that you would see, like, you know, very subtly how, you know, you go in a different way. And however interesting this sounded, it was clear that this, this thing would not work. <laughs> so uh, it was an idea which survived about two weeks before going back to the drawing board and uh, realizing, like, yeah, nice try, uh, but we probably need something else. But I think already in discussing it, uh, it was clear, like, it would be nice to have something where the letters said more than, than just phonetical values, but it communicated something extra, but it was not clear what it should be. If you talk about typography, we often, you know, in technical terms, we talk about design parameters. <coughs> and, uh, you know, th there are some major parameters, which are the weight and width and uh, angle and contrast and uh, types of series and hor horizontal and vertical proportions. And there are many other, kind of, the more parameters you add, the more detailed they, they do get. Um, there was an idea to possibly use these different parameters to parametrically change the typeface. So again, by manipulation, it expresses something more. Here is an idea. <laughs> again, what everything I'm showing is work in progress, which has been discussed going back and forth uh, it's a uh, it's largely teamwork, uh, so I have to credit the whole team at uh, Antegral. I've been largely responsible for type design, but uh, you know it's a team team project. And um, well, okay. So idea is that if you have a map of Paris and you have a center and you have like a four different uh, directions: south, east, north, west. What if each of them served as kind of design master, and then depending where you go, it changes towards something. So, you know, it could become more circular or more rectangular. And then progressively, very subtle, would, it would change. So this, it would be something like this, you know, when at what point a circle stops being a circle and becomes a square? At what point it starts being a triangle? You could fill these possibilities and possibly apply this to typography. It's basically very much inspired by this. You know, you probably know it, uh, this is uh, Herod Nordzai and his kind of three-dimensional hypercube where you have three different design parameters applied uh, to, to, uh, to type. So you get a broad nib and you get a, uh, and you get a pointed pen and you get a weight uh, all going on. Each of this E is different, each is functional, and you only see the difference if you compare it to another one. So if you see one, it's just a normal E, but if you see it in comparison to something else, you see how it changed. Could this be something to be used for orientation, you know, on two-dimensional surface, uh, where you know, like, a depending where you go, a, a type would change parametrically, without you being really conscious of it, but it would express certain value. Uh, so, another proposal I made was this, you know, like, so what? What about if you choose, you know, four different models? And it doesn't really matter what models would be but choosing models which are sufficiently different from each other, and then drawing this kind of interpolation along the lines. And so if you happen to be in different places, the typeface would look different. So every location in Paris has a different G a GPS location and would have a different typeface associated with this place. Could this work? You know, I don't know, uh, but we have to try. So we would have to try like a dis different possibilities of for example, what would happen if you interpolate a conventional sans serif with, uh, you know, s sans serif without using any uh, round shapes, only straight lines? Is it weird? Is it normal? I, th I do think that it's sufficiently conventional to perform. You know, it's not something you will notice. No, it's not something that will disturb you. At the same time, again, the difference is only in compar comparing one way to another. So if you imagine you're sitting in a met metro and you're going from south to north, you could sense just by looking outside where approximately you are if you're perceiving the shapes of, of letters. It's a far-fetched idea, but I think it's worth idea worth exploring. You know, what would happen you know, if we take something like this and apply it to very functional uh, environments such as you know, orientation underground? Uh, so we tried diff many different things. Um, here it was Gustavo Ferreira who was helping me with scripting in, in Robofont environment. Uh, 
building about 8,000 bubbles per letter to allow something like this, you know, like uh, how change shapes should change. So again, creating this kind of endless system of possibilities where depending which line, you know, you would imagine all these metro lines as kind of interpolation lines between different models going from, you know, every line of a metro would be kind of, and every stop would have a different typeface associated with this. I have to say that I got really excited about this. Uh, you know, it's not something I've seen. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's, you know, functionally it's performing well enough to for the job. At the same time, it has this different added value. Um, so we'd have a lot of discussions about it. Uh, you know, in a project like this, you know, like uh, it's not a one way. You know, it goes back and forth and back and forth. It was rejected and accepted and rejected and rejected again. So I was left with uh, going back to drawing board and saying like, uh, it's a great idea, but it's not going to work for us. And, uh, and we really want to have a single typeface. Um, you know, again, by starting a project like this, you have to accept you know, these kind of little setbacks or change of plans. And in a way, it's not a setback. It's a just this decision for the larger good. You know, like, uh, you know, Antec now is making sure that the all these different components they're working on, they're performing to the best of their abilities. Um, they made a decision that this was probably too much and not helping the, the bigger plan of the metro. Uh, and although they agreed it was interesting, it was not quite fitting to, to their plans. So at the end, they did ask me to stick and create just one single weight, one single typeface, which basically I did. I mean, if you look at these things, there is a typeface already made, uh, except it was made for the different purpose. It was made for this kind of um, modulation for, for change. Now we have to make it static. And this became the typeface. Um, I've been asked to make one, and they said like they want medium. But again, how do you know what is medium? <laughs> there is no such thing as a medium. It had to be made. You know, like I had to make you know, the, the, the light and bold. So I had to make something more than they ask. You still ask to do one thing, but do you ha have to create uh, you know, different sets to, to, to make it work. So there's a heavy one and a lighter one. Um, and I'm very happy I did because uh, twice in the project they said like, well, I we want to have a step heavier typeface. You know, if I indeed drew the medium, I would have to redraw everything. By drawing you know, the masters you know, on each side, it's fairly easy to make it heavier without redoing the whole thing. So uh, I think it's a lesson you know, like for everyone, like a, you know, the, the typographic weights or colors don't exist on its own. It's only in comparison to something else and you have to kind of find out what is the right weight or color. These are photos from uh, Antigral office, which they, uh, when I, I would go there once a while and uh, this is a uh, Rudy bar and this is uh, Denis Coignot. Uh, Eva Kubini was very much involved in managing the, the most parts. And, uh, and it's the first time we start looking at this in you know, the right sizes. So it's uh, something else designing it on a, on a small scale, but it's completely different when you see, okay, what would be the actual real size uh, applications uh, where you get a sense of you know, scale and, uh, and the color and, uh, and ev everything else. This is obviously their work. You know, they're responsible for the overall scheme. What they're doing, I'll probably talk about the illustrations a bit later. Um, and these are small mock-ups. Uh, these are small models which were created uh, using you know, this very large dominant typeface. Um, just one style, uh, nothing else. I think very quickly we realized that um, this is about installation. This is a lot more than just printing type on surface. That this is going to be, you know, dimensional typeface. But then, how, you know, how how do you design something more dimensional? So uh, this was part of the project, you know, to explore extrusion. You know, like uh, what would happen in public spaces if we were to, uh, you know, make it more, more dimensional. Uh, there hasn't been any decision made yet. Uh, these are some of the models I made um, about what would happen when, it, when it's more dimensional. Um, you know, it can be very, very subtly. It can have a texture. You know, how to make sure that it's readable from different angles. Uh, so these are just 3D models. Um, 
again, I don't really know yet what, what's going to be used. Um, I think what is exciting is the multilingual approach. Until now, if you look at the metro, it is in French, English, German. Um, but usually the Germans and English, they probably need less guidance reading you know, Tour Eiffel you know, like, uh, or Louvre. You know, it's the people outside of this place which struggle with Latin script. They need more guidance and more help. So the decision right now, and I hope it will stick, is to using, uh, using Arabic, which is an important language. I see Japanese, but I, I was convinced it was Chinese. So um, I have to sh check like what's the current state. Uh, so using you know uh, other scripts which are, which are traditional ones. Uh, again, it's too early. Most of the things are not final. I think it's a it's a luxury to talk about this because it's a project which is not made not realized yet. Uh, many things will change, but it's because it's a public uh, project we can discuss it. I think it's a luxury of you know, there are many projects which I'm working on which we cannot discuss because they're made for private enterprises and we have to sign non-disclosure agreement. This is a very different project because it current concerns uh, the public here and the work is very well documented and presented in different stages. So last summer there's been an exhibition about the work made until now uh, so people can respond to it. And I think it's a quite nice kind of open approach to designing rather than waiting to the last moment and then surprising everyone with, uh, with final solution. Um, so the languages are not decided and that's why, for example, Cyrillic is a placeholder. There hasn't been this decision about the use and that's why it hasn't been designed. I would love to design Cyrillic for this especially because I find it not great. I think it's too dark and it's not quite uh, fitting there. Uh, the Arabic works quite well and it's actually Greta uh, which shares some of the, the vocabulary and because it exists in so many different colors, it fitted, uh, Greta Arabic fitted really well in there. The Chinese here, it's, uh, it's uh, Noto sounds from Google, which works fairly well. And these are the, some of the maps, which you may or may not have seen, which is this, this is the circular one. I forgot which line, is it number 18? Um, 15? Yeah. Where is it? Yeah. Um, again, I cannot emphasize enough that it's a work in progress, but it is the best there is right now. And some details. Um. It's, I find it incredible you know, to work on something, again, that will only be Im implemented so far ahead. And I've had this experience before. I worked on uh, the Vienna airport, for example, uh, 10 years ago. And then the airport was not yet finished. So only 10 years later, it was finally, terminal was completed and the whole uh, uh, orientation system was put in place. And people would say like, well, this new project is amazing. And you go like, new project? You know, something you made 10 years ago? Like, uh, you forget about it. You, know, you don't really pay attention to it. This is even more extreme. You know, like, uh, the, the final implementations are aimed at sometimes in 2030s. And knowing the big scale public projects, usually things take much, much longer than planned. So I think this is still the best case scenario when it's 2030. But there are a lot of components which are in place and uh, we have to see like, uh, how it will you know, what, what will happen. There are a lot of possibilities what will happen. One of them that it will be implemented and used. Um, what Antegral and I think it's personally Rudy, Rudy's idea, uh, which they put a lot of attention to, is they, the different train stations are designed by different architects. So they're all, all different and they feel different and you feel like uh, it's not a uniform space. At the same time, they invited different il illustrators. So every station works with a different illustrator, which illustrates the area around you know, where you come up. So when you're down on the ground, you see you know, what is up before you go there. And there are different takes. Uh, it's not made by one person, but every station is in interpreted by, by different people. Uh, 
we actually made a separate typeface kind of handwritten for the use in, in illustrations, which will accompany the illustrations, which will tell you about history of the, of the neighborhood. So it's kind of handwritten typeface, which is inspired by the main typeface but it's used only at illustrations and these handwritten maps. So most of the maps will be drawn by people who live there, uh, which, will, which is quite, quite interesting. Right, I think this is my last slide. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Peter, for this uh, very nice presentation and uh, this uh, recent case study, which is uh, <coughs> on the run, I think. It is. <laughs> um, is there some question for, for Peter related to his, uh, I, I, I would say, in fact, it's a, a really a graphic design approach and uh, not only type design approach. I don't know what's the difference <laughs> because uh, what is design approach or graphic design approach is that you consider the implementation, you consider the users, so you anticipate what happens with this rather than just doing forms. So I think every typeface should consider you know, like, uh, what someone will ma make with this, how they will use it. So I think it should be part of every project. I think every serious typeface, I believe like uh, even the students there, you know, they make in briefs and they make in specific situations where typeface should be used and they're testing it then. So I, uh, that's why this is no different. You know, like, uh, it's just make sh making sure that it's relevant for the, for the job. Um, and I hope it might be. You, you, write, uh, you wrote uh, an article about uh, why designing fonts uh, today. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a comment. And there's a, uh, I, I think what's very interesting, there is a, 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 a no manierism. Uh, there is a, something to tell, something to, to create uh, forms and shapes, and not only uh, uh, something look, look like. What is your, uh, your position in the, in the field of the... <laughs> it's, uh, in the last couple of days, there was discussion in type, des type design forums about about types and possibilities of type. And it started with the comment of uh, Rudi van der Lanz from Emigre of, you know, that the gaps between typefaces st starts being reduced. You know, we start filling the gaps with, there's so many typefaces made that, you know, the possibilities are reduced. And I have to say th uh, that it is fact, you know, we have more and more fonts and then more and more kind of gaps are being filled, you know, like, uh, so we insert even something even closer to Frutiger and even closer to something. At the same time, I believe that the possibilities are expanding in other directions. So it's not just filling the gaps between existing ones, but we start understanding, um, you know, tec well, technology, technology in different ways, but also our own uh, experience in different times. I don't think we had a t chance to reflect past in the way we do now. I don't think I could make a project like history to do 50 years ago. I don't think I can do a lot of the things which I'm doing now, I could not do it before, so in a way, new time gives us new possibilities as well. So it's working in both ways. It's reducing some gaps and it's opening other gaps because uh, our understanding and more our access to information is larger than any time before. So I'm excited about possibilities of type design because I do think that if you look in far enough, you can find new possibilities for expression and you do it with you know, other languages which, are, which haven't been explored and they have so many languages which don't even have digital fonts for God's sake. You know, and, and even in the Latin script, I think there are possibilities to explore which haven't been. You know, we haven't been considering, for example, time aspect of, in, you know, like a, the screen is obviously refreshing. You know, you could do, you know, something which animates itself. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're having headlines of newspapers, why are we not doing it? You know, because first, you know, the software doesn't allow us maybe to do it, but, you know, like a, it's usually creation drives creation of tools and uh, you know, I think there are a lot more that can be done instead of recreating what has been done in the past. Okay. Is there some question? Yes. Okay. 
Yeah, uh, since you are uh, one the co-founder of uh, um, Fonston, I have some question about uh, how the Thai business is now re reorganized. Um, what um, what do you feel about the the fact that uh, the, the the sole uh, uh, independent uh, th type designer they, they, they feel uh, som somehow be perhaps betrayed by the the major between uh, font shop and uh, monotype and so on and they they are uh, creating more and more their own stuff and they they join uh, a, a new distributors there is font there is font stand there is type networks. How do you do you feel about that, and what do you foresee about this uh, redistribution of uh, type bu type business? Well, it's true that the situation in the market is changing, but it's changing everywhere. Like uh, it's happening in the movie business, in in, f in music industry, and I find it exciting where the authors actually take an active position. Until now. You know, again, if you think 20 years ago, it would be unthinkable that the authors of typefaces had actual business plan about what to do with their work. I think it's, again, we're experiencing first time that we're using the same creativity that we're using for creation of our stuff, design, music, whatever, also about considering creative ways of distribution. distribution. I think it's largely necessary to take responsibility for this as well. Rather than complaining about someone else doing a wrong job, I think you know y at the end, ultimately you can control your own work, and you can make choices. You know you don't have automatically one single choice that you have to put your phones to my phones. Uh, it is maybe the easiest of the choices, but there are alternatives, and I think the, the, the choices you mentioned show that there are alternatives, and I'm sure there will be more alternatives. And ultimately, you know, alternatives also just working on yourself uh, and and deciding. Uh, that you know the way how you sell and distribute fonts is part of your creative thinking rather than you know just using what has been made maybe 20 years ago and which may not be relevant today uh, so I think it's exciting time Well, I, must I, I want to thank you for your, it was very clear. Uh, 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 I have seen several things in what you've explained to us. The, the necessity to, to go uh, in the time, in the past, and in the future. Just to, to, to moving in the time, and not to just to be uh, just of today. Another part uh, I think it's important is about literature. Uh, I think you, it's quite an approach like typography could be like literature, could be the invention of a language in the language itself. I think of uh, James Joyce or Raymond Queneau with some milliard, some mil milliard of poems. I can't tell it in English or uh, style exercises. The, the variation or in, in painting for the same. Uh, I think it's a great demonstration for us just to remember that typography is about meaning, it's about literature. It's not just about information, just about brief. And um, well, uh, I, I, you, you haven't ins insisted very much about this, this uh, thing, but uh, as I read your essays in your in t in, in, in typotech, I always see this part of the creative, uh, the creative part of your, your way of doing. Well, that's it. Uh, and I want if you can comment or, um, a little more. Thank you. No, I'm, I'm glad to hear this, bec that, it, that it is visible, because indeed, you know, we, again, talking about only what, you know, creating what market wants, I think there's a lot more that, you know, like, uh, we can do uh, something which can be relevant, but can be also very personal. I think that's what ultimately I would strive for. And talk about literature, you know, like, uh, it's inspiring to see, you know, the small inventions of that happen in literature and in, in again in millennia of you know that since the Greek you know comedy has evolved, that it's a cumulative inventions and every invention kind of stays and opens up new doors to new authors. Uh, and no one complained that you know the you know someone stole the comedy from the Greeks. You know, like uh, the comedy is being used by different cultures. Uh, you know 
now the small inventions of Kundera or someone else are being used by other writers. So uh, in the same way how we do cannot complain about literature running out of possibilities, I think type design can also not complain about running out of possibilities because these hum accumulation of ideas opens up so much more. So I see more open doors than closed doors. Uh, but again, it's a point of view. So some people can see it from different angles. Thanks. There was a I don't know if I saw well, but I, I, I have the feeling that the, the typeface was called Cachon. Screen. Yeah. Now it's, now it was uh, just the s smallest, l shortest uh, station ah. where we could demonstrate it. Because <laughs> every other station was so long, so we could, we sketched just the w one word, uh, which was one of the stations. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think typeface is called Grand Paris. Grand Paris, okay. Yeah. Okay, and then I, had, I have a very stupid question, but I have to, to pose it. Um, I designed once a logo, uh, it was France Design, and I used um, a typeface of Lubalin, and I was so much criticized that I used an American typeface to do a French logo about something French, and I thought, what the fuck, uh, I, I just choose the, the typeface that I, sh I found right. So. Uh, I wanted to have your feeling about um, working on a big French character uh, being uh, not French. <laughs> it's, a <laughs> it's a stupid question, but... Uh, no, no I, I think it's a very good question, and I will probably hear from you. How do you feel about it? Because, uh, of course, I'm very proud to be able to be part of it, because it feels like Paris is a lot more uh, than just, you know, like a you know, it's so, such a metropolitan, such an important world city, and it feels like uh, you know being part of this. Um, and it's it's a question if you know like uh, something should be preserved just by nationality or not. You know, like, and I don't have an answer to this. Uh, and it may as well be criticized by people that it's not the right choice, uh, and indeed should be. You know, there's plenty of talents. You know, like uh, there are plenty of people who could do maybe a better job. Uh, you know, I, I, I've been proud to ask for it, to be asked. I have been, you know, I did my best to respond to it, but I don't know, you know, like if it's uh, ultimately, it's a question to someone else to see, like, if it's uh, appropriate or not. Uh, I wish, you know, it was simpler. Uh, uh, you are very welcome to do this project, uh, Peter, because <laughs> you, are, you are a Parisian, too. On Paris, it's, op it's an open city to the world, so... Welcome, uh, welcome back to Paris. No problem. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Now especially, I mean, like, uh, um, you know, we've been working on it for a long time, and uh, it's the first time I'm, I'm speaking about it. I haven't shown it to, to anyone. I was asking at the Ante uh, like, how they feel about on, it. On even uh, the first station built ever, the first station started for Grand Paris is Clamart. Oh. Yes. Well, the closest. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. So you are welcome back to <laughs> Paris, <laughs> Peter. You have to move back to Paris too. Well, I was the weather is better. Than I was thinking the I'll the stay my grandchildren to see it, like a, like a when it will be finished. Yeah, you um, you you visited us uh, last uh, April or something like that, and uh, the station was uh, launched. Uh, I mean, the beginning of of the work on the station was a month later. So okay, so they started digging the tunnel. Yes, exactly in Clamart. Yeah, but it will take some time before it's ready. Yes, yes, but uh, there is al already some large sign okay. uh, near the train station with your typeface. Oh, okay. Yes. So you've seen it. Okay. Yes, yes. Did you yes. know? Did you know what it was? Yes, since already almost uh, one year and a half. Okay. Uh, yes, I have. I have. I've downloaded your web fonts. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so ah. That's life of typeface today. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So um, you, we said that um, type is about uh, meaning uh, of of things. So uh, how do you design uh, Arabic typeface and Hebrew typefaces without, uh, or do you speak Hebrew or Arabic? Uh, how do you do? Um, okay, it's a, it's a complicated uh, question. Um, first, 
typeface you know makes the lang it captures captures the language. There is a big difference between speaking and writing, um, which can be demonstrated in many different ways. You know, I I worked with different scripts and I've been always very careful and very uh, starting a lot with a lot of research to understand how it works. And I came to conclusion that you know when I did uh, some of the research, I noticed that for example. Pradel, which is like a you know equivalent of Garamond in Spain, he created the most beautiful typefaces in Spain in 17th century. He was illiterate. He was able to crea create beautiful typefaces, which are until now one of the most useful ones in Spain, without being able, able to read them. But he would have an understanding of how the different shapes are used and being you know like, uh, applied. In the same way, I believe that uh, a knowledge of language is very useful, but it's not ultimately pre-required for a new project. If I'm, I can create a typeface to be used in Finnish without speaking Finnish, because I'm creating you know, letter shapes which I'm, f I'm familiar with. I develop familiarity with certain letters, although I cannot read Finnish or Swedish or Norwegian or many of the languages for which I'm designing it. I suppose many people know that you know, even in Latin script, you can express it in so many different ways beyond your own language. When I worked with Arabic or Hebrew, uh, you know, the typeface which I showed started seven years ago. And for the first two to three years, I was completely uncomfortable. It, it feels like a child speaking for the first time. You know, like you're making a lot of mistakes. I never showed it to anyone. I was learning to write. I was learning to, I was looking. I collected, I basically created a map of possibilities from most ridiculous ones to most serious ones, from conventional ones to experimental ones, to understand expressions of, of a culture and of a language. From those, I start kind of like over time, when you're not rushed, you can start uh, having sensibility about what these different expressions offer you. And uh, again, I don't think you, could, you can do it very quickly because uh, you know, if I work with Latin, you know, a lot of things come without studying them. You just understand them because it's part of your culture. If you're dealing with other culture, you don't have the starting point. So you start from zero and you have to do a lot more homework to get to the position that you can start contributing to a different culture. But I do believe that you can do it if you do this homework. And, and often, you know, I consult locals. You know, I, I work with, with, with uh, local designers to be sure that, you know, like a, that we control you know, the final results in a way that should be controlled. Again, it's not the fastest way to, to do, and uh, you know, all the my non-Latin projects took took way longer than anything else. But I find it more exciting because I it's like learning a new language, and then when you write a poem in a new language, and then you can express something. Uh, so it's exactly the same feeling that I speak a couple of languages, and it enriches me as a person, and uh, that's why I'm always curious to discover a new language and how it works. You hear me? Yes. You have a great experience of multi-script and multilingual uh, typefaces. But regarding the Grand Paris project, I'm a bit puzzled by the problem that if you ever want to address the problem of uh, tourism in the 10 or 20 more years, it, we can expect 300 million Chine uh, Chinese people going abroad. It was only 10 million uh, in the early uh, 2000. So those Chinese people will be touring mainly central Paris. They are not all perfectly literate with all the 3,000 plus uh, characters. So you have to use some uh, Chinese, simplified Chinese or Chinese script, which doesn't fit very much for your very bold typeface you showed, which I think uh, basically also uh, uh, very tightly fit. So I think your project is very nice to show that there is some people behind and graphic designers working hardly as uh, Rudy Bohr likes uh, to show to his clients uh, probably all the time. Um, but uh, I think there is a how you address the problem of the complexity of Chinese characters in this project. Well, it's 
first of all, um, the decision about how many languages to be used is not taken yet. You know, like, uh, it's something, it's our desire to use five languages, which client didn't ask for. It's more than has been proposed. Um, so we've been kind of putting these different languages for them to get used to the idea of you know, working with so many different forms. Um, but at no point, you know, there was a real job to say, okay, so let's see like, what Chinese fonts to, to use there. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't really got there. Uh, I don't really think that the Chinese cannot work with both. I don't think that's true. Um, I especially like, a, you know, maybe possibly in very, very small text, it's more complicated, but like a, in larger sizes, I haven't really seen it as a, as a challenge. Um, so there are ma many different ways how to do it. You know, of course, a set of pictograms is being developed, you know, to be sure like uh, that some information is redundant. It's being repeated in different ways, visually and verbally uh, and, and in written form. Um, and, you know, like a, once the decision is taken about you know, the multilingual typography, which I hope it will be you know, soon, it can be taken as seriously as, you know, as, the, as the other languages. I think it's an important thing. I think everyone kind of realizes it, but uh, unfortunately, decision, I don't think about it that it was taken. So I think it's a one thing at a time. It's, this is more of a placeholder at the moment. Uh, Last question? No? Maybe I have a last one. Uh, do you think type design is related to oral expression? To continue the... And uh, for when, I, when I look at the Campari uh, option, do, 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 do you think about uh, animation and uh, animated typeface in order to switch from language to another language? In fact, it's, uh, do, you, do you think about this option uh, in the process? Um, it's my belief that the type design works like a voice. And uh, you know, some voices are more effective to communicate some uh, messages and some are less. And uh, you know, so by finding the right voice for the occasion, you, you, know, you, being, you bring in clarity or you, or you bring attention to, to certain information. Um, the the role of animation is very much linked to technology. Uh, there have been various technological solutions explored, and uh, uh, and they still are. Uh, one of them uh, are more kind of e-inking panels, which you know we've been looking at, which would kind of give a lot more flexibility about for information, because uh, they are not very tiring uh, for to read. They can be refreshed. Uh, you could change messages. Uh, you know, they, they possibly can exist in very large formats, but you know, we, we're dealing with something with, again, for the future, and it's, you know, like a, so I think also part of the decisions about final uh, rendering of type is being postponed, and I think rightly so, because, uh, you know, if you would choose technology of now, uh, it probably is too early to, to do it. I think it's a unique project for for the fact that it is made so early, because usually, like, uh, in every other project, this is the last thing to do. When everything is ready, it's really like <gasps> quickly we need to put some information there. Now it started from from this, which is I think exceptional. Uh, you know, we, we can you know wonder if it's the right decision. I, f I think it's a I interesting one, um, but that also means that uh, you know how the way how project is made is that uh, this is all kind of conceptual proposal, which will be implemented by a third company which is unrelated to this. And, and so these are basically guidelines which will be interpreted uh, and not used as it is. Um, so I think there'll be a lot of variations and a lot of different decisions still taken and adapting it to different technologies. Uh, so again, work in progress. Thank so you. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> <laughs>